Well, welcome back, students, to another week of Sunday School. It's so great to be with you this morning as we open up God's Word together and we continue on in our study, uh, the life, embracing the life of a Christ follower, looking at what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ. In the first part of the study, we're introducing discipleship, looking at what discipleship is and what does it look like. And today, in this lesson, we're going to see that salvation empowers discipleship. And our main point is that through a saving relationship in Jesus, we are no longer separated from God by our sins, but are instead reconciled to be in relationship with Him. So before we start talking about discipleship and what does it look like to be a disciple, we need to realize in order to be a disciple, you first must be saved. That's where it all begins, in, in salvation. And so in today's uh, session, we're going to be looking at salvation. And we're going to see why you need to be saved in the first place. What, what's the problem? Uh, how are you saved? And what's the purpose of your salvation? Now, last week, we looked at the essence of discipleship. We saw at its core what discipleship is. And what is discipleship following Jesus? We saw those who are disciples of Christ have received an invitation from Jesus to follow him. They've accepted the invitation immediately and completely, and uh, Jesus then makes us fishers of men. And we saw this as we opened up to Matthew 4, and Jesus called his first disciples. And today we're going to be in the book of Romans, which is an awesome book in the New Testament, one of the Apostle Paul's greatest letters, which is all about the doctrine of salvation. It's an amazing book. If you want to understand salvation, of what salvation is biblically, you, you need to look no further than the book of Romans. But I have a question for you to start out today. Have you ever had an enemy? Has there ever been somebody in your life that you just haven't gotten along with, that has opposed you in everything, has just been your enemy? And I think back on my life, I haven't had a whole lot of enemies. Generally speaking, I, I get along with people. But there have been a couple people in my life that maybe I would consider enemies. And I hope they aren't anymore. They may think that of me. But uh, having an enemy is not a great thing at all, is it? It's, it's not a comfortable position to be in, to have enemies or to be someone's enemy. Well, biblically speaking, what we see the scriptures teach you and me is that before you came to know Jesus... Or if you're apart from Christ this morning, then you are an enemy of God. Before Christ, you were an enemy of God. Or apart from Christ, you are an enemy of God. And this is an astonishing reality. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be anybody's enemy, but you especially don't want to be God's enemy. What makes us into God's enemies apart from Christ? Well, this is where we enter into why we need to be saved. And, and the problem that you and I are facing, and it's the problem of sin. So as we begin talking about salvation, really we have to begin with the problem of our sinfulness. And we'll be in the book of Romans, like I said, and these first two verses we'll look at are very familiar to most of us. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 is what we used to call the Romans Road as a way of sharing the gospel with people, and these verses would be a part of that. But I want you to listen to these two verses and see it, just see what they have to say about sin. You may think you understand what sin is, but we need to see what the Bible says sin is, and what the problem with sin is. So Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what do these two verses tell you and me about sin? Well, the first thing they teach us, the Apostle Paul teaches us, is that sin is a universal problem. We saw this in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. Everybody has sinned. Everyone watching this video has sinned. Everyone in the world has sinned. And this is contrary to what our culture believes. I remember the song by Luke Bryant, 
where he says, I believe most people are good. And that's really what the world believes, uh, by and large, that most people are basically good. They're good outweighs their bad. But what the Bible teaches us is, hold your horses, everyone is a sinner. And what is sin? According to Romans 3.23, sin is falling short of the glory of God. So what is the ultimate standard that you and I will be held accountable to? It is the glory of God. It's His inf infinite worth, worth and majesty. It's the, the attributes of God, the glory of God on public display. Uh, that, that is the, the glory of God. So sin is falling short of the glory of God, His holiness, His perfection. It's falling short of that. So we've all fallen short of the standard. And there's a consequence of sinning. In Romans 6.23, what is that con consequence? It is death. The way Paul puts it, for the wages of sin is death. It's just like if you have a job and you're in high school and you go and you work, you're going to get paid a wage. Likely, it's going to be close to minimum wage. It's not that great, but you earn some money for the work that you put in. And uh, Paul here is saying, hey, the wage you earn for sinning against God is death. And he's not just talking about physical death, he's talking about spiritual death here. And this spiritual death is a terrifying reality. Spiritual death is separation from God. And this separation from God goes on for all eternity if nothing is done about your sin. So you see the problem here. We, we have the problem of sin. Why did we need to be saved in the first place? Because you and I are sinners. We have fallen short of the greatest standard of all, the perfection, the holiness, the glory of God. So that's where it begins with salvation, our sinfulness. We are needy people. But God didn't leave us on our own. And the, the next question we're going to be answering is, how can you and I be saved? How has God provided for our salvation? To do that, we need to turn to Romans chapter 10. So turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Here Paul provides a very clear explanation of how one is saved from their sin. And it begins, you see this in verse 9, with confessing in your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. This means that you publicly confess Jesus as Lord. You publicly are in agreement with what the scriptures teach about Jesus, that he in fact is King of kings and Lord of lords. But it's not only just agreeing with these theological teachings or these theological concepts, but it's personalizing them. Not only are you saying Jesus is Lord, you're saying that Jesus is your Lord. He is your personal Lord and Savior. He now has ultimate authority in your life. That's what it means for Jesus to be Lord in your life. He is now a boss. He takes control. Before Christ you, were in con you thought you were in control of your life. You ran your life. And how well did that go? Not well at all. Because it just landed you in more and more sinfulness. But when you come to faith in Christ, you confess Him as Lord. Your Lord and Savior. He is now boss. He is now in charge. And not only do you confess Jesus as Lord, but you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And so this belief, it's more than just intellectual uh, agreement or intellectual knowledge. Notice you believe in your heart. The core of who you are. What makes you, you. You believe with all of you that Jesus has been raised from the dead. That God raised him from the dead. The resurrection is really the foundation of our faith. If the resurrection didn't happen, you and I have no hope of salvation this morning. But it did. It's a true event of history. 
And we can have all the confidence in the world that the resurrection of Jesus did happen. And in order for you to become a follower of Jesus, you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart at the very center of who you are, with all of you, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if this takes place, you will be saved. In verse 10, you will be justified in the sight of God. This means that you are declared right, or you're seen as being in right standing with God. Because what takes place in the gospel? Your sin, your unrighteousness, is placed on Jesus on the cross. He bore your sin and the punishment you deserved for your sin on the cross. And in exchange, you receive His righteousness, His 33 years of perfect sinless living, so that when God the Father looks at you, He sees Jesus' perfect righteousness, and He looks upon you with approval, and you are in right standing with Him. You have been justified. You have been saved. So that's amazing. How can you be saved? Confessing with your mouth, He's Lord, and believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then who can be saved? Look at verses 11 through 13. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the amazing truth about the gospel. Who is the gospel for? Everyone. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul says there, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. God doesn't play any favorites. He is looking for someone who has this brokenness, this humility that realizes they are a sinner in desperate need of Jesus. And they trust in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Anyone who would call upon Jesus' name will be saved. And that includes you. It doesn't matter how badly you've sinned or messed up in the past. It doesn't matter how terrible your failures are. If you call upon the name of Jesus, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that is the great message of the gospel, that we can go out and we can declare to anyone, because everyone has the opportunity who hears the message to come to faith in Christ. When we trust that Jesus rescued us by dying and rising again from the dead, he gives us new life. And this is a reality that's open to anyone who hears the gospel message, repents from their sin, and places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So we've seen the problem of our sin. It separates us from God. And if nothing is done about our sin, we will spend all of eternity separated from God in hell. But God didn't leave us on our own. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And if we confess him as Lord and believe in our heart he was raised from the dead, we will be saved. And that's for anyone. So in salvation, Jesus has rescued us amazing. And if this was all of it, man, that's good enough news. But now we're going to see that he didn't just save us from our sins. He saved us for relationship with him. What is the purpose of your salvation? Well, he desires to have a relationship with you. And when you come to salvation, when you come to faith in Christ, that is the beginning of a relationship with God. That's the whole reason he saved you in the first place. He reconciled us to God. And I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 5 now as we look more into reconciliation and the reason why you were saved. Romans chapter 5, look at verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the amazing truth of the gospel. We see God's provision in salvation. He died for the weak and ungodly. Who were you before Christ? You were weak and ungodly. And you were a sinner in Romans 5.8. Right? You weren't lovely. Uh, God didn't save you through Jesus when you were lovely and attractive to Him. No, He saved you in the 
pit of, uh, of your sin. You were so unlovely, all right? You were weak and ungodly. Um, and yet He loves you so much that He sent His Son Jesus to die for you while you were still in your sin. Amazing truth. And that's how He demonstrates His love for you. He's, he has met every one of your needs for eternity. And what did He accomplish in doing this? Look at verses 9 and 10. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. So once again, Paul tells us that through uh, Christ's accomplishment on the cross, we are justified, made right in the sight of God. He is our propitiation. He satisfied the wrath of God. The, the wrath of God is his response towards sin. He bore God's wrath on the cross, so we are saved from the wrath of God. You talk about mercy. That is the ultimate mercy right there. And then he reconciled us to God. And this big word reconciliation, all it means is when two people have been separated, they're, they're at odds with one another, if they're to be reconciled, that means they're brought back together on friendly terms. So when you think about being reconciled to God, you're separated from God by your sin, but when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you are reconciled to God the Father. You're brought back to friendly terms with Him. You've been reconciled to God. Wow, that is amazing. Now you and I can have a relationship with Him because of the work of Jesus. And, and this truth brings Paul so much joy. And it should bring us joy as well. Look at verse 11 in Romans 5. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul rejoices in the truth of reconciliation. The fact that he can now have a relationship with God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Why did God save you through Christ? Ultimately for his glory, but secondarily so that you would have a relationship with him. Jesus, in John 17, 3, describing what eternal life is, he, he defines it this way. He says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see what eternal life is? It's knowing God and knowing the one that he sent, Jesus Christ. Knowing God. That is eternal life. That's what differentiates Christianity from every other religion on this planet. It's all about a relationship with your Creator, made possible by Jesus Christ. He wants to have a relationship with you. And this is really the beginning of discipleship. It begins with salvation. You can't have a relationship with God if you haven't been saved. So have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus? Have you turned from your sin? That is the invitation this morning. Enter into a discipleship relationship with God through Christ by being saved. God has done all the work for you. You simply need to respond. And it's as easy as confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And the Bible promises you will be saved. And then begins the adventure of discipleship, the lifelong pursuit of a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I love you and I'm so thankful that you went to the lengths that you did to save me, a wretched sinner, when I was weak, when I was ungodly, when I was unlovely, you sent Jesus. I'm so thankful you didn't wait on me to get my life together, because that would have never happened on my own. Lord, and that's the truth for all of us. We're thankful that you've pursued us, you've sought us, and you've made a way for us to be brought into relationship with you, to be reconciled to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray if anyone is watching this this morning and they don't know where they stand with Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would know for sure where they stand with you. Lord, I love you and praise you and ask all this in your Son's name.